it's early on Sunday morning and I've just been able to watch back um, the Kovalev versus Sobranski fight, um, Ustinov versus Char, and Jason Sosa versus Uriokas Gambala. At the time of recording, I haven't taken the time just yet to watch the Sullivan Barrera fight. I uh, don't know if that was a, a classic that I've missed out on or not, um, but I'm sure I'll get time later on in the day. Um, let's start with Kovalev versus Sobranski. Um, I thought this was a big fight for Sergei Kovalev. Um, he's 34 years old. He's coming off two back-to-back -back defeats. The last defeat was by stoppage. Um, he's had problems outside of the ring. I believe he's had problems with his former trainer. I believe he's admitted to having problems with his alcohol intake. Um, and you kind of wondered if this was a turning point in Kovalev's career. Would Kovalev ever return to the Kovalev that we were all familiar with prior to the two matchups with Andre Ward? You know, Kovalev was one of the most feared fighters out there. Um, hard punching, ruthless, non-stop aggression uh, with a real boxing pedigree. And my question was would some of the fear factor have dissipated from his image after those ward defeats? Would fighters go into the ring with increased confidence that they were now facing an older Sergei Kovalev? A Sergei Kovalev who'd suffered problems in his career. A Sergei Kovalev who didn't have the power to stop Andre Ward across two consecutive fights, despite the fact that Andre Ward was coming up from a lighter weight class. You know, I thought some of that fear factor may have started to go. I thought fighters would be coming in more and more confident against Sergei Kovalev. Well, if that was the case, his performance last night is going to put pay to some of that confidence because he looked pretty devastating against Vyacheslav Sobranski for the, uh, I think it was the WBO version of the light heavyweight title. Now look, Sobranski, we kind of know what he's about. He's a fringe contender. He's not a top 10 light heavyweight. He's not a world-class fighter. He's not an elite fighter. But nevertheless, he's something of a yardstick. We kind of know there or thereabouts where he's at. And Kovalev showed complete and utter dominance against that sort of level. Um, Kovalev, I don't know how many times he dropped Sobranski across four rounds. I think it was three separate knockdowns and then the referee jumped in to save Sobranski just as the fourth knockdown was about to come. I think there were four separate instances with the fourth one ending in stoppage. Sobranski was dropped very, very hard twice in the first round um, and you kind of sensed going into the second that he wouldn't really get out of that second round. Sergei was patient. He waited for his openings and when his openings came, he caught Sobranski. To be fair, he kind of caught Sobranski with a lot of cuffing punches. But even those had the weight and power behind them to instantly render him hurt uh, on unsteady legs, etc. And really, the writing was on the wall from the minute the first knockdown happened. Sobranski couldn't recover. And he really had no ability to cause Kovalev any notable problems or offer anything in terms of the fight, you know, complete dominance from Kovalev. He shows he retains his uh, his instinct for getting fighters out of there. He shows he retains his power and his will to win. Um, and clearly Kovalev deserves to be in the conversation at the very, very, very top of 175 pounds. And he is still very much a major, major threat to all contenders out there. I actually thought he looked slightly gaunt on the way to the ring. He looked... You know, he looked like he a little bit drained for my money. Kovalev's always been a big light heavyweight. And as he gets older, it's not going to be harder for him to make the weight. So I was wondering if that could potentially affect his performance. But it didn't seem to, even though it was only over two rounds. The only negative I'd give is, I noticed two occasions where he was, um, I think one of them he was caught by a jab from Sobranski. And he looked very off balance. Um. You know, there's two occasions, I think, one in each round where he goes backwards almost in a stumble. But that's me nitpicking, you know. Um, neither time he was hurt, neither time Sobranski had done anything notable. It's just I noticed a, a lack of balance on, on two separate occasions. But clearly off the back of this performance, we know that Kovalev um, is still a threat. Uh, we're kind of aware that his well-being is there and that he's dedicated to the sport. 
and um, that he is still very much in that conversation at the top of 175 pounds. Uh, Adonis Stevenson, or Adonis Chickenson, as he was again called by Sergei Kovalev after the fight, he's kind of having an odd career at present. Stevenson's 40 years old. He fought once in 2016. He only fought once in 2017. You know, we're late November 2017 and there's no fight schedule for him. So once in 16, once in 17. You know, at 40 years old, you're kind of thinking a fighter should be looking to make their money in big fights and get out of the sport. You know, not facing Fanfara in a rematch that really no one wanted to see. So I don't know what's happening with Adonis Stevenson. You know, I did hear rumours that he'd fight Badu Jack, which would be a, a great fight if it did happen. But... You know, surely at 40 years old, Stevenson's longevity in the sport is limited. Uh, some of the new guys who've recently won world titles, Bivol and uh, Betabiev, they were talked about after the fight. Uh, I think the Betabiev fight is one that should get made. You know, Betabiev, he's 32. I presume he hasn't made a huge amount of cash from the sport of professional boxing just yet. Um, and that would be a fight that would be interesting. You know, two guys known as exceptionally big punchers. I think... Does Arthur better be able to have a hundred percent KO ratio? I'm I'm not sure. I think he I think he may do. Obviously, there's some um, history between Kovalev and, and Better be uh, from the amateurs. Uh, so yeah, who knows? Who knows? Maybe that's a fight that could get made. And you're at 32 years old. Better be is going to want to get some big fights, get some big money, and you know, start making waves sooner rather than later. I appreciate that he's well known to the hardcore. I appreciate he's just one of us in the world title, but his profile isn't where it needs to be generally in boxing. So maybe that's the fight that could get made. Uh, as for Andre Bivol, uh, I kind of think Bivol's being brought along at a different pace. I think he's only, I know he's had 12 fights. I think Best Be might have had 12 fights, but yeah, Bivol's a lot younger. He's only uh, 26 years old. I kind of think they want to give him you know, another year, give him another three or four fights, get him a bit more experience before putting him in with someone like Kovalev, you know, whereas with Betabiev being that little bit older, six years older, having that amateur experience against Kovalev, maybe that's more of a natural fight to make. Uh, Sullivan Barrera won on Kovalev's undercard. Um, I haven't seen the fight, as I mentioned, so I can't tell you how he looked, um, but he's another highly rated guy. Perhaps he's another one who'll be thrown into the mix. But, you know, Kovalev, he strikes me as a guy who wants to make lots of money from the sport, uh, possibly the unification fights are going to be where that potential income is at. So we will have to see. We will have to see. But certainly interesting stuff in the light heavyweight division. Kovalev's back. He's still very much a threat. And I'm not saying necessarily that he's the Kovalev of old, um, you know, because when he was coming up through the ranks, he was <coughs> he was one of the more devastating fighters you'll see. Um, <coughs> sorry, that time of year fighting off a cold um so i'm not saying he um you know is is, is going to be the same kovalev we saw three or four years ago when he was just running through opposition uh, at a high level um but he looked good he looked good <coughs> sorry guys you have to bear with me a little bit um so yeah i think that's what i've got to say on kovalev um good to see him back and, um, yeah, a devastating performance. He um, looked like he's still a threat. Uh, Gamboa versus Sosa. Uh, Gamboa wins by majority decision. Uh, I didn't score the rounds with a pen and paper. My initial feeling is that the scorecards were very wide and that Jason Sosa can feel very, very, very hard done by by the results. Um, one of the judges had it 96 to 92 in a 10-round fight over Gamboa. Now, given that Gamboa... Um, was hit with a punch that was ruled a knockdown. And I actually think that he was knocked down earlier on in the fight as well, and it wasn't ruled a knockdown. Um, and given that additionally he had a point deducted, I think that's a crazy scorecard. Because, you know, what that judge is saying is effectively that's eight rounds to two as a scorecard. And they've taken a point off because of the deduction for holding. And they've taken a point off because one of the rounds was a 10-8 round because of the knockdown. So essentially he scored the fight eight rounds to two um, in favour of Jason Sosa, and I, I, I think that's a farcical scorecard. You know, the one who had it 94 94, you know, six rounds to four in favor of um, Gamboa with the deductions. You know, I'm not gonna have a massive issue with that. I thought Gamboa started well, I thought he looked like he'd fade, uh, but then I thought he got his second wind. 94 94 isn't crazy. Uh, 
saying it's so serious and crazy. I do think having it eight rounds to two from Gamboa was crazy. Another questionable scorecard in the sport of boxing. Um, let's talk about the heavyweights. Let's talk about the guys who fought last night for the WBA regular title. And uh, we'll maybe come on to a discussion of that WBA regular title in just a little bit. But first and foremost, Alexander Ustinov versus Manuel Char. Um, I kind of wanted Ustinov to win. And I'll, I'll tell you why I wanted Ustinov to win. It's not because um, I'm a huge Ustinov fan who's been following him for, for years. Not, not, not at all. Um, it's more that Alexander Ustinov um, is kind of less exposed than Manuel Char. We kind of know the level that Manuel Char is at. You know, Manuel Char, outpointed by Johan Duopar, knocked out by a cruiserweight in uh, Marius Bredis. Um, he, we we kind of know that Manuel Char is not a world-class heavyweight. We kind of know he's not in that top 10 or elite mix. We know what sort of level he's at. Um, Ustinov's kind of had an odd career. You know, he's now 40 years old. Uh, he hasn't really fought at much of a level, even despite his age. You know, he had the loss to Kubrat Pulev, but, you know, that was back in 2012. Uh, and since then, um, you know, I know he fought an aged David Tour and got the win against David Tour. But really, he hasn't fought anyone of note since that loss to um, to Kubrat Pulev. So it's kind of an odd career. You kind of feel that he needed pushing three, four, five years ago when there was more left to give. And now at this stage, um, he's just kind of got a weird resume. A guy who's had a lot of fights, a lot of years in the sport, but hasn't really had the noteworthy fights that you associate with the experience he's got. At, at one point, Yusinov was a promising heavyweight. You know, I think he had that kickboxing background. And when you look at him earlier on in his career, he was a little bit more nimble. Um, you know, he was never like a, a mega athlete, don't get me wrong. But he's kind of a guy who's wasted his potential by taking poor fight after poor fight after poor fight and taking too long to step up to this sort of level. Uh, he's, got, he's got a weird resume, he's too old. I just felt that he had a bit more promise than Manuel Chara, and that's kind of why I wanted him to win, because uh, I, I thought the winner of this belt would probably get one or two other televised fights, maybe get in against some UK prospects. And I thought Ustinov was a sort of slightly less exposed version of the two. So I wanted Ustinov to win, and I actually thought Ustinov looked, looked very good not very good, but he looked good comparatively early on in the fight. Um, at halfway after six, I had Ustinov 4-2 up. Um, I thought Ustinov was winning the fight by activity and by range. I thought he was putting Char on his back foot for Lars Porsons of the fight. And I, I just think Ustinov was doing enough um, to win the rounds. You could straight away see holes in Ustinov's game. And you could see that despite the fact I felt he was winning... Um, you know, he didn't have what it takes to be a, a top heavyweight. His defence was really, really poor. Um, he kept his hands low for the entirety of the fight. Um, but he was very upright with no head movement, no upper body movement. And because he's kind of slow, very slow on his feet, very plodding on his feet, and he's very tall and very upright with his hands low, he became exceptionally easy to time. Um, and you saw Manuel Char starting to utilise a left hook punch, which Char used throughout the fight. And it was landing with too much regularity because Yusinov was just there, straight up in the air, hands down by his waist, no head movement. You know, it was literally like hitting a stationary target, especially because his feet were so, uh, were so slow. So, um, you know, that was, um, that, that was poor from Yusinov and there was no adaptation. He kept getting hit by that left hook, kept happening. Uh, did he put his hand up? Did he try and adjust the reins? No. He kept applying the same losing formula, kept eating that punch over and over and over again. And that was the punch that later on in the fight led to the knockdown. That was the punch that led to the cut. You know, that was the defining punch of the fight. And Yusinov should have realised he kept getting hit with the same punch. It was Charles' biggest area of success. And he should have tried something a little bit different. But he's kind of, at this stage, a, a route one fighter who's got one method of fighting and... If that doesn't work, there's not really too much of a plan B. Um, for a tall guy, um, for a rangy guy, for a guy who liked to fight at length, I thought his jab was very poor. He didn't commit to it. I don't think I saw a double jab from Yusinov, um the entire fight. Um, he just kind of used it out there as like a pouring jab, like a range finder type jab. It wasn't really effective. His power punches were slaps. You know, they were very wide 
almost like straight arm punches, slappy stuff, and he wasn't really doing any damage to Manuel Char. You know, in the early rounds, I was scoring him to Houston off, um, but his jab was weak, his power punches were weak, he never looked like he was going to bother Manuel Char. Um, and maybe, you know, this is because he hasn't had the right level of opposition. You know, Ustinov has got 25 KOs. He went into the ring with a 70% plus KO ratio into this fight. And he's used to those sort of punches, just overwhelming opponents. But when you face anyone at any sort of level, you're going to need more than like a pouring jab and slappy wide punches to get them out of there. And he just didn't use the jab as a weapon. He didn't have a defense. He didn't make any adaptations. There was no snap to his power punches. He was slow-footed, so I kind of had him up based purely on work rate. Um, what became clear when Char started to come into the fight more in the second half, round seven onwards, I would say, Yusinov was only capable on his front foot. You know, he, he was winning rounds when he was able to use his size and range to push Char back. Um, but when Char came into the fight, Yusinov had very little on his back foot. And when, you, uh, when Char started having any success, Yusinov gassed very quickly and, you know, seemed to have his gas tank empty. Um, Char, for what it's worth, he's an unspectacular fighter. He really is. You know, it's kind of hard to know if these guys are. I know it's for a WBA regular world title. Was this fight even the matchup we saw recently for the Euro title between Chisora and Ajit Kabayel? Potentially, Chisora and Kabayel represented a higher standard than these two. Uh, Char was solid, but solidly unspectacular. His jab was okay. Had some success with it. His left hook was successful. He scored a good knockdown in the 7th. Uh, sorry, I think it was the 8th. He wobbled Yusinov in the 7th with the left hook. Um, there was something of an uppercut in there from Char. You know, Char looked decent. It's a little bit more footwork, bit movement. Unlike Yusinov, who was completely static in terms of his upper body and his head, Char threatened with a few angles on occasions. You know, he'd kind of dip a bit low, take a quick step to one side, and then he'd come in. You know, there was a bit more sophistication from Manuel Char, a bit more schooled. On the whole, his punches were a little bit more snappier. Potentially, they were slightly better constructed. Um, potentially, he was, you know, putting them together slightly better. Uh, they looked slightly heavier. They looked slightly faster. So, on the whole, I think the scorecards were fair. On my scorecard, I had it 115 to 112 in favour of Manuel Char. I scored it seven rounds to five for Manuel Char um, with... Uh, Yusinov suffering a 10-8 round due to the knockdown. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, fair play to Manuel Char. Yusinov still has something to offer. I thought in the first six rounds he looked semi-capable. Um, I still think Yusinov is better than going straight in to be chucked in with um, like prospects. You know, I don't think they'd want to put like a Daniel Dubois or a Joe Joyce in with Yusinov just yet. Someone at that stage of their career. Maybe he will be used for, like, your Chisoras, your Huey Furies, your David Prices, your Dillian Whites, that, that sort of level as, like, an easy mark. I don't know. Uh, as for Manuel Char, he's got that WBA regular title. I suspect that means he will get a big opportunity at some stage of his career. Um, I believe that Fraser Quendo is owed a shot against it. You know, I know this fight was initially announced as a WBA regular. Then there was some news that it wasn't. Now it seems that it was for the WBA regular. I don't know if Charles is going to have to defend it against Fraser Quendo. I don't know how old Fraser Quendo is, but he must be mid forties, and he's been horribly inaccurate. So uh, inactive, sorry. So based on that inactivity and age, you'd have to make Manuel Char a big favourite in that fight. Charles only 33, 34, and possibly coming off a career peak win last night. So. Um, you know, Char will get something of a payday against a coin, though. I can't imagine too many promoters will be wanting to put a big box on it. But then if he wins that, potentially, you know, another fighter will pay him big money to fight for that belt. I don't know if it's a Huey Fury or a Dillian White or, you know, some of the UK money or maybe one of the US heavyweights like a Brazil or something like that. They're going to want to get their hand on a world title. Um even if it is the regular person. And maybe Char can get in one or two big fights and make a few quid from having that bauble, I guess. So uh, we'll have to see. I suspect this win does mean Manuel Char is, is going to be um, back on the fringes of the heavyweight division and potentially getting some fights. Um, you know, the fact that these two are fighting for a regular title, uh, for a world title, even if it is the regular person, is, is pretty outrageous. Neither of them have, have notable wins uh, for you know an extended, extended period of time. Um, Yusinov has been fighting purely against sort of journeyman uh, level opposition. Uh, Manuel Char, I know he beat him 
an undefeated fighter last time out, um, but it was an undefeated fighter I haven't heard of. Um, not, you know, he's had three losses since 2014. It's kind of hard to see how he justifies the position for fighting for a world title, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, he's got his shot. Uh, any other comments? I thought Steve Bunce was pretty average on commentary on the Box Nation footage last night. Um, you know, Steve Bunce, I actually quite like him. I quite like his insight. My, my instinct is to like him, but he kind of cheapens the whole presentation of a, you know, of a broadcast for me. Um, I appreciate Box Nation started off with Steve Bunce on a sofa, you know, but it's kind of moved on since now with the BT Sports deal with some of the fighters they're working with, and you just kind of feel that he, you know, cheapens the presentation really. Some of the stuff he comes out with is just bizarre. You know, at one point he said, I think he said he was bored by the fight, or he was bored by Alexander Ustinov, and then next round said it was a very entertaining fight, or you know, something like that. When Yusinov went down, Steve Bunce said he did the boogie. The amount of times he called Yusinov a big lump. He kept saying that Manuel Charles was bishing and bashing him. Uh, you know, it, it was it was just a typical Steve Bunce performance. But he doesn't represent, like, you know, we talk about levels in boxing. He doesn't represent the elite of broadcasting and commentary. And if the aspiration for Box Nation, BT Sports, whatever, is to... Uh, have a, a you know grade A presentation, which they've now got in certain elements. You just wonder if Steve Bunce is the man to deliver it for them. But I, you know, I'm sure people have their own opinions. But anyway, that's my thoughts, guys. To summarise, Kovalev is back. He looked deadly against a fringe opponent. Um, you know, the interest in Kovalev is there. Um, he's reminded us who he is, and let's see him in a meaningful fight. It would be very very interesting to see him in a unification. Um, Fort Gamboa got a lucky result on the scorecards and his career continues even at 35 as a result. And um, Alexander Ustinov, for me, disappointed. Manuel Cha uh, put in a decent performance. Uh, Manuel Cha probably will get a decent payday or two out of this win because he's picked up that strap, even though it's really bizarre that the strap was available. As for Ustinov, maybe he goes down the opponent route. I still do think he's got something to offer. Maybe he'll get one or two fights at Euro level before he, you know, descends to being the type of guy that prospects beat up. Let me know your thoughts, people. Leave your comments in the section below. If you've enjoyed this video, please do hit the thumbs up button. If you're new to the channel and you haven't done so before, please do subscribe. Uh, please also check out the links to my various social media um, and ways to support the channel in the description box below. Many thanks for tuning in.